everyone, this is Richard from Modern Healthy Hong Kong. Welcome to the first in our series of interviews with Professor Kennedy of the National University of Singapore. In this video, Professor Kennedy discusses the work he is doing in Singapore, which already has the fifth longest lifespan in the world and is now focusing on extending the health span of its citizens. Professor Kennedy is taking a very practical approach to establish what interventions work for extending health span in humans. He covers his work with the government and the trials that he will be running. And with that, let me start the interview. Dr. Brian Kennedy is a professor in the departments of Biochemistry and Physiology at the National University of Singapore and director of the Center for Healthy Aging at the National University Health System. From 2010 to 2016, he was the president and CEO of the Buck Institute for Research on Aging, where he remains a professor. Dr. Kennedy is internationally recognized for his research into the biology of aging and for his work to translate research discoveries into new ways of delaying, detecting and preventing human aging and its associated diseases. At National University of Singapore, Dr. Kennedy's broader goals are to develop new interventions to target human aging and to validate their efficacy and ultimately to create strategies to promote their widespread use. Hello, Professor Kennedy, and welcome to Modern Healthy Hong Kong. Thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, thanks. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. So, Professor Kennedy, you're based in Singapore now, as I understand it, and you're working with the Singapore government on how aging will affect the country in the future. So, and I think this is, this is forward-looking. You know, most countries seem to be ignoring aging or attempting to manage it on the assumption that kind of frailty and chronic illness are inevitable. And it's like, how, how, do, they, how do they manage that process? Uh, rather than trying to address those issues. Um, so would you agree with this? And can you talk about what you're doing kind of proactively with the government in Singapore? Yeah, I, I think that it's uh, actually it's just the opposite. You know, people tend to think that aging is inevitable, but we can treat diseases. Mm. And I think we've, we've found that a lot of these chronic diseases are very difficult to treat. And I actually think that the data, mostly from animal models, but some human data suggests that aging is quite malleable. So uh, our belief is that given that aging is the biggest risk factor for all of these diseases, it's going to be easier to slow aging and prevent disease than it is to wait till you get sick with something and then try to fix all the problems. And uh, that's really the revolution in medicine that we're trying to stimulate, that we need to stop doing sick care and start doing health care. I think most governments are still struggling and grappling with this concept for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, partly because medicine is entrenched, uh, health insurance uh, is based on reimbursement for treating sick people. Uh, it's very difficult to do preventative clinical trials because they're expensive and take a long time. And so there are lots of challenges to changing uh, the, the, the course of this uh, health, uh, healthcare ship. But I think that uh, our model of trying to target the biggest risk factor, which is aging, uh, is likely to have much more benefit in terms of extending the health span of the population. Singapore uh, has recognized the challenge of aging. I mean, they're looking at a situation where they only have two workers for every retired person in 10 years. Um, and given that, you know, you have a small island that there's not much room for more immigrants and you have a very low birth rate, you know, it's a big challenge. We have to figure out a way to keep these people healthy, hopefully keep them working um, keep them active and empowered in society uh, to get the, the, the best benefit from the population. And I think that while Singapore recognizes that, they're still trying to figure out how to, how to meet this challenge. And uh, uh, what we're trying to do is begin to do really human clinical studies to show that some of these interventions we've developed from animal models, and by we, I mean the whole field, not just my lab, uh, but we want to show that some of these interventions that have been developed from animal models will actually uh, be validated in humans and we can show that they can extend health span and then implement them in the population. Right. So have you started uh, human trials in Singapore? Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> not quite yet. Uh, mm -hmm. We should have been started around uh, February, but uh, we've got... Uh, things got a bit delayed from COVID-19. Uh, so we're right now in the late stage of approvals and we should be up and running as soon as we can get these clinical studies off the ground uh, when the virus is a little bit more under control. Right. C could you talk a little bit about what your first trials are planned to be? 
We're yeah, doing. happy to do that. You know, I think that the challenge, I think, so in the aging space right now is how do we take the knowledge of what we gain from animal models? Uh, we know how to slow aging in animal models, but how do we take that knowledge and apply it successfully to humans? And so you have biotech companies that will take an approach like a senolytic, for instance, uh, that kills senescent cells in the body. And then they want to figure out how to uh, develop it in the private sector. Um, well, aging is not, still not recognized as a disease and not really accepted as a risk factor that you can get reimbursement for treating. And so a lot of companies will choose a disease to try to treat. So they have something that really probably extends health span, uh, but what they want to do is treat some disease so they can make money off of it. And I get that. But a lot of those clinical studies are not proving to be efficacious at this point. And so I think there's two paths we need to go down. Uh, and one of which is to take the kind of approach that Nir Barzilai is taking with the TAME trial and try to use a preventative approach to try to prevent multiple different kinds of chronic diseases simultaneously. And so I'm very supportive of that trial with metformin, which is planned in the United States. Um, the challenge with it is it's extremely expensive, it's long-term, and for a drug like metformin, which is off patent, it's very hard to raise money to, to do a 50 or $60 million study. We're doing shorter term studies, trying to look at interventions that affect biomarkers of aging. And so uh, I, I really believe in these recent biomarkers that like the epigenetic clock and any others that have been developed. And we're trying to use those as endpoints to show that our aging interventions can either slow their progression or reverse them. Um, so the first studies we have planned, the first one is really just a cross-sectional measure of biomarkers of aging in the Singapore population, because many of these biomarkers haven't been applied to Asian populations to, to any extent, certainly not in Singapore. And we want to understand whether these biologic age predictors act the same way within this ethnicity and this uh, cultural background in Singapore. Um, and moreover, we want to look at multiple biomarkers simultaneously. The idea is to see how they relate to each other. There still haven't, haven't been enough studies done trying to address this question. So if I measure your biologic age four different ways, will that give me the same number? Or is it going to give me related numbers or completely unrelated numbers? And, and, and that's a, a challenge the field has to understand. Um, Certainly, I expect there to be overlap in these biologic measures of aging. And if there is, and we can identify those redundancies, then we can hopefully develop a relatively low cost method to uh, measure biologic age in an individual, something we can scale to a population level. Um, and then the next two studies are intervention studies. The first one will be with exercise. Um, and the second one will be with uh, a supplement, alpha ketoglutarate, that, that we're really excited about. And I can talk more about that if you're interested. Right. Yes, I would be interested. And also the um, talking about the biomarkers for age. But yeah, maybe we'll come, we'll come back to that. Um, sure. So, but one question related to that. So how long would that trial be? Um, I mean, when would, you th when would you expect to have some initial idea as to... Uh, this uh, combined biomarker for age? Well, I, we're, we don't, the answer is nobody knows. Right. <laughs> there, have been, there have been a limited number of studies so far, a very small uh, participant size. Uh, there was one that we published in Aging Cell and one of the editors in chief of Aging Cell. So uh, I'm pretty aware of the study. It was nine individuals looking at three different interventions over the course of a year, and they were able to reverse their biologic clock using uh, methylation by two and a half years. Um, that's a, what I view as a precursor type of pilot study. We, we're going to be doing larger studies with placebo controls, uh, but uh, we're hoping that within six months we can see some measure of change in these biologic clocks. But it may not be the case. It may be that we have to do longer studies. There's some indication that we can even do shorter studies. So I think that we don't have a good understanding right now. The way I view it, though, is that the interesting thing is the interventions that were developed to slow aging came from one kind of field of research. And the biomarkers came more from machine learning and large data analysis, which was a different field of research. And so if, if they fit together, 
it, I think it really tells us we're on the right track in extending health span. And so I, I look at it this way, like the interventions are keys and the, the biomarkers are locks. And so we have to figure out which keys fit in which locks. And when we open those doors, what are the physiologic benefits that come from that? And so that's really what we're trying to do. We're less concerned about getting immediate approval from the FDA and, and more concerned about understanding how these different puzzle pieces fit together and developing first generalized and then second personalized approaches to really drive health span as far as possible. Mm, yes. Yeah. Um, so w while we're talking about government, uh, we're, so have, have any other governments kind of come and wanted to talk to you or ask for advice? I mean, it, it, it just seems like something that they would want to know about. Yeah, I, I've met with representatives of many different governments. Um, maybe don't get me started on the United States government at the moment. That could be a long discussion going in a direction you don't want. Uh, right. But I, I will say that, you know, the NIH, and particularly the National Institute of Aging in the U.S., had an initiative based on geroscience, which was essentially the understanding how aging contributes to disease and looking at interventions to target aging as a means of preventing disease. Uh, we wrote a, a highly cited review on that as a result of an NIA-sponsored meeting in 2014. Uh, it had a lot of momentum. A lot of the other institutes at the NIH were intrigued. And then when it came time for the other institutes to throw money into the <laughs> equation uh, to really develop this program, things kind of got stalled. And so, uh, you know, the National Institute of Aging is, has been ahead of the curve on aging research for a long time. It sponsored a lot of the research starting as early as the 70s to understand aging. So, um, you know, I think that we have to give them some credit for that. But the health system in the U.S. is so perverse. The incentives are so perverse that it's, it's very hard to figure out how you're going to change that, change that system. Um, you know, I, I'll give you an example. I had a, a, a CEO of a chain of hospitals come to visit me once when I was the CEO of the Buck Institute this nonprofit research center and uh, we were looking for a gift from the from the hospital chain and i explained to him what i wanted to do and he said why would i give you any money if you're successful you're going to reduce my procedures by 60 percent, and i won't get reimbursed as much and so um you know i i think most of the most, all, all of the doctors i know and most of the people in the pharmaceutical industry are, are really get into this because they want to help people and, and they're doing research and they're doing clinical practice to help people. But the incentive system is so screwed up that it's hard to make, to, to, to make meaningful changes, and especially when it comes to preventing disease. If I had a perfect drug with no side effects um, that extended health span by 10 years, I'm still not sure how I could develop that in, in the U.S. Um, I think that the, the U.K. is making strides. They've got an initiative on health span. And they talk about that a lot more uh, within the context of the health system there. And so there's hope there. Um, China is starting to put a lot of money into aging research. Uh, and, and also Hong Kong has put some money into developing private sector research in the biologic space that some of that might be targeted at aging. So um, there's promise there. And I think a lot of other countries are intrigued and I've spoken to many, uh, but no, most countries are not yet ready to take the plunge. And, and what I'm telling them is that you can't wait 10 years and do it. The problem's going to be rampant by then. And you can't build enough hospitals to take care of all the frail and sick and people and the people with dementia. Uh, so why don't you start now and then again developing interventions that'll keep those people from getting frail and keep them from getting Alzheimer's disease. And you'll save a tremendous amount of money and improve life quality at the same time. But, um, for most countries, it's not quite resonating yet. Mm. Yeah. Um, thank you all for watching. I hope that you found this video informative. For us, the key takeaways from this video were that the demographics of aging will affect country economics, and Singapore is actively looking at ways that this can be managed. Delaying aging will also delay the onset of several chronic diseases, such as diabetes and Alzheimer's. Extending health span or healthy life expectancy in this way could dramatically curb rising healthcare costs. Extending health span has been shown in animal models 
and the next step is to show this in humans. For this we need to try different approaches to advance human trials, both with long-term trials such as TAME using metformin and shorter term ones like those proposed by the Center for Healthy Aging in Singapore, which also includes lifestyle interventions such as exercise. And finally, finding an accurate measure of aging will be key to getting faster feedback on the efficacy of these interventions. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.